Hello everyone and welcome to the Recipe for Greatness podcast. I'm Jay Greenwood. Now, the goal of this podcast, we talk to the founders behind some of the best food companies in the UK to find out their stories and see if we can deconstruct how they did it to find the knowledge and the skills that they used to grow their business. This week's guest is an amazing founder. We've got Angie from My Cookie Dough. Now, if you guys have been to any big shopping centres like Westfield in London or Manchester, Cardiff, you may have seen My Cookie Dough there. They have beautiful shops. The branding is amazing and they make the most incredible desserts. It's given them a cult following on social media. They have, I think, 136,000 followers on Instagram. And we sit down and talk about her journey, how quickly they grew, expanding from, you know, they're up in Cardiff across the country. And we talk about how they built such an amazing brand and how they broke that process down. So sit back and please enjoy my conversation with Angie. From my cookie dough. Hi Angie, thanks so much for joining the podcast today. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you for having me, Jay. Awesome, awesome. So what I wanted to start this off with was what I found so interesting um, was how you're one of the rare founders that actually started off in food. So I read that you went to Reading University and studied food science. So, that's right yeah. yeah then you started nutrition was that always the plan to head down that route um it, food has always been my passion from a really young age so it was always I always kind of knew I loved food I loved nutrition too um so I studied at university and then um after university we went in and I worked into the food industry um and just doing what I love working with food amazing and yeah. I think I think I heard you say that um, you kind of came up with the idea at university. So how does that conversation come around? How do you say, right, cookie dough, business, what, what, how does that happen? So uh, sort of how it actually started to kind of come together was um, I, at university, I was always passionate about food innovation. Um, and so was my business partner, Ricky. And then we left uni with this kind of thing in the back of our minds of wanting to one day do some type of food business, something new, something that doesn't exist in the UK. Um, And it was always kind of in the back of our minds. We never really did anything after university. We went and worked in the food industry, mainly in manufacturing. So I was doing a bit of technical roles, development roles. Um, And we used to always enjoy cookie doughs, like soft baked cookies um, as just desserts. And I think one day we were sort of like, you know, why can't you get this? product in shopping malls for example where you know I spend loads of my time you don't have that many dessert options so it sort of started off as a little bit of a kind of fun funny jokey idea and then we were like you know what let's let's just give it a go let's let's try and see if there's something there why not right so why not well when you were you know like you said it was in the back of your mind do you think you were actively searching for a gap in the market or do you think it was kind of more of a light bulb moment where you were like, this is missing? I would always be, so from university, I was always looking at new concepts. I was just really intrigued by anything that was new, new in the food industry. I just love innovation. So I was always looking out for the next kind of new thing, but the cookie dough thing was a bit more of a light bulb moment. So after we came up with the idea, we were like, well, this doesn't actually exist anywhere. So we, we might be onto something. And w- were you spotting like a trend in another country at all? Or was it just more, we've seen it, we think it will be great. Let's, let's have a look if it's here. Not really, actually. It was, it was um, we didn't see anyone doing fun, cool desserts in shopping malls in particular. So you can get ice creams, which are great, and you can get waffles, which are really good. But we didn't see anyone doing anything, which is a bit more, a little bit out there, a little bit kind of different. Awesome. And you, so you come up with the idea. I think it's 2014. And you're like, right, we're going to set up a, a cookie dough brand. We're going to do it. How do you then, 
how long did it take to go from that idea to actually launching your first place? Was it a month, a year? How long did it take? <laughs> so we opened our first store December 2014, but the idea started a year before that. So it, it took us a year to go from idea, concept generation, to actually opening a physical store. And what, what were the main elements involved in kind of getting it started? Was it the, the recipe? Was that one of the main things you had to get right? Or were it just the, sort of the combination of everything just took a long time? So it was coming up with the concept in general trying to piece together a little bit of a business plan, but we had really no idea at the time. Yeah. Um, and then, and then really it was, are we going to get a green light? Because we can't really move forward unless a shopping center agrees to have our product in their stores. So we didn't do any of the real development work until we had a green light from a shopping center. So that's when things got a little bit crazy. I think the shopping center approved our concept in October. And we had two months to develop our recipes, get funding, because we had no money, um, and, and do our finalize our branding and our kiosk design. So you had the shop and everything ready before you even had the recipes and everything nailed? We, ha we had, no, we had nothing ready. And then we literally, until the shopping centers agreed to let our, us open um, a shop and they gave us the lease and, and everything else, that's when we started all the kind of real work really so yeah. developing developing every single recipe all the cookies all the all the product development um the design for the shop fitting um and you know trying to get trying to get some fun to actually buy everything wow i mean that is definitely giving yourself a deadline that you have to meet in a quick amount of time uh, yeah it was pretty foolish at the time yeah. but we we just somehow did it i don't know how and did you have any uh, mentors or what how did you kind of navigate your way through that was did you reach out to people was it just online research or so we were really lucky because we we had a mentor from day one so at the point of actually coming up with a concept we had an amazing mentor who who's still with us today and very much involved in the business and that was a real good it was the key thing for us to have that guidance from day one to do things with um, you know, business planning in the back of our minds, always thinking about the viability of, of the business. Um, so yeah, that was hugely important to have. And um, how did you approach the mentor? Because I imagine, you know, a lot of people get approached all the time who have experience in certain areas and, you know, they have to make a choice on who they actually give advice to and who they don't. Was there a certain approach that yeah. you took to to kind of convince them to help out? Um, so we already knew of, um, of him because he's, he'd worked with my, with my business partner before. So he kind of, uh, I think, I don't know how he convinced him to work with us on, on my cookie dough, but I think he kind of saw our passion um, and he's, you know, the fact that it was a bit of a new sort of concept, new for the market. Uh, and, and I think also with my cookie dough, there was never really a, a roof to how far it can go. You can obviously open in shopping malls, but you can open perhaps in cinemas. Or there, so there was always like room for growth in different ways. Uh, so I think hopefully you saw the potential in that and, and, and just in our passion, how, how much we kind of loved the concept. And how important would you say that having a mentor has been to kind of your success and how the business has grown? We wouldn't be here if we didn't have a mentor. So it's, it's, it was essential for us. Great. I mean, yeah, I'm exactly the same for me. I was, uh, put, I put mentors down to probably like the best thing that I'd ever reached out to people to, to get because they've helped me so much. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Wow. So yeah, cool. um, I wanted to touch on, so, so you, you've launched the store, it's going great. And then you, I think you get, you, you win an award, don't you, for design. And then that's the point where you decide right, Ricky and I were going to go full time. So before, mm -hmm. before then, what were you and Ricky doing? Were you busy still working or what was going on? Yeah, we were working. So um, Rick left his job before me, actually. So I was still working um, at that time at a, at a great company. It was, a, it was like a large bakery providing 
sort of um, baked goods for big retailers, big supermarkets. And I was doing a, quite a technical operational role at the time. And I would, um, I would take a few holidays to do work, um, guilty of perhaps a few sick days as well, just to do my own personal work. <laughs> um, and I would just finish work on a Friday and I'd be off doing working all weekend. That's, a, that's on, amazing. On you must have been so busy trying to get it all up. And what was it like when you decided to to leave your job? Were you nervous, or did you just kind of, you know, you, you felt like my cookie dough was kind of gut ticking along and it was going to work out? I was so scared. I had to. Ricky had to convince me a lot to to make that final move because I was really nervous. Um, you just feel like you, you do feel like you're leaving something that's secure and in, in stepping into something that is just very much in the early days. You don't know what's going to happen. You know, you're probably going to not um, have a salary for a few months or for even longer. You just don't know. So I was really scared. But as soon as I kind of went in and met my manager and gave my notice in, I also felt a little bit like, OK, I feel free. Like I'm ready to just go and focus on, you know, once I did, it, I felt fine. Amazing. And you touched yeah. on it then um, about working at the bakery. Was working at the bakery a tactical move to kind of learn a little bit more about sort of the baking and the operational side of stuff, or was it just purely coincidental? Um, it was a little bit of both. I did, I did want to work in a role that uh, had some involvement in baked goods. But, yeah, you know, in the food industry... I think if anywhere I worked, whether it's been in, in the past, I did ready meals. So I just think all of it was really helpful and giving me some knowledge on, on that side of, of yeah, business, product development and technical stuff. Great. And um, yeah. do you feel that, you know, having a job while you set the business up gave you a good feeling of security rather than just jumping straight into leaving a job, setting up a company? Do you think having that job kind of made you feel a bit easier about everything? I mean, for me, yes, because I'm a little bit more of a cautious person. So I just wanted to have I, that backup, that security. Um, it gave me a bit more confidence. Uh, but I think you don't necessarily need to have that. Sometimes you do have to go full steam ahead if you believe in something. Absolutely. And I mean, so when I was reading about the story, I did not know that after I think it was like your fifth or sixth store that you'd open up, you guys went international, right? That, that yeah. is mind blowing. Because what I read was yeah. that you guys went, you know, to the Middle East before you'd even gone into London. What, what, what why was that? Like what, what was the, the, the that moment was, you think about it? Yeah, it's a little bit crazy, but so we opened our first store in Cardiff because, because, the, the lovely landlords at Cardiff actually believed in our idea and they let us open in their mall. And there was a student at Cardiff University who, who went to the shop every, every week. He loved it. He was obsessed. And he, he said to his family that, you know, when he finishes university, he wants to open, open this store in his country. And he was from um, the Middle East, Oman. And um, so he approached us after he graduated, like he said he would, uh, and said, you know, I want to open this business in my country. And to be honest, it was, he was such a great guy and he was following his dream. And so for us, we kind of connected with him on that and wanted to make it work for him. Um, and like, you know, we, always, we also wanted to kind of explore that expansion side of things in, internationally and see what it would be like. Um, so yeah, that's sort of why we went ahead with it. And then as soon as we kind of opened one store, then there was a lot more interest from other, other regions. And how do you think about opportunities presented themselves like that do you think you know sometimes you just have to say yes or for that one were you really cautious about it because it seems like for there you were just like we're doing this let's why not do this as well <laughs> we've been we've been saying yes to every opportunity that came our way pretty much in the beginning i think i think you sort of have to sometimes when when it's the start as long as as long as those opportunities align with your brand and they align with your vision and goals, you, you got to kind of just jump in and take them as they come. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And uh, you touched on it briefly a moment ago about how Cardiff was the first 
place to kind of believe in you. I assume, and I don't know this, but you approach other places and they maybe weren't as um, you know recipro reciprocal on the idea as you'd hoped. So you're, what, you're right, yeah. What was it that you, about Cardiff that you did to convince them to sort of take you on board? Um, so we did all our, we did a lot of research about every single mall in the UK. I mean, we started in London and tried to meet with Westfield, who said, you know, come back when you've got some, some substantial data to show that your concept can work. So we left the office thinking that sucks, but you know, mm. and then uh, we went around and we did a lot of research on, on all, on all of them. And St. David's in Cardiff was, it was quite a, a fantastic mall and it had visitors from all over the world because of the university there. So it was a good opportunity and, and we kind of presented to them something that we thought was lacking in, in the mall. They didn't have any great, exciting dessert concepts and we thought we were you know, filling a bit of a gap for them. So we just also got a bit lucky that they, they, you know, they brought into something that wasn't even in existence. So that was a bit of luck there too. And then you said yes, like you always do, and then you know the rest is history. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so you touched on it there, and this is something I really want to talk to you guys about because you have an amazing brand. So I wanted to talk to you about. Thank you. Yeah, I mean it's great. I mean it's I it's so playful, and I just absolutely love it. And I was wondering, at what point did you start to think about the branding when you were coming up with the idea? Like, when, when did it all go, right, we need to build a brand around this like you have now? Day one. So the vision from day one was, we want to have a global brand. But I had no idea, I, have, I, I had no idea about branding or marketing. But I knew that from day one, stepping into it, both me and Ricky wanted to build a global brand. So it had to be part of our process from the beginning. Everything we did had to revolve around the mission being, you know, create a global brand, create something that is, you know, one of the best desserts that people get to try. And was there a, a starting point that you guys began at or was there a strategy or, you know, was it advice from mentors? Just a starting point where you were like, right, we need to start here to build the brand, start to start thinking about something to then build on it. Um, I mean, in terms of the visuals of the brand, we, at the beginning, we had no idea what we were, we were doing. It, I wouldn't even show anyone a picture of what it used to look like, but we, we sort of, we sort of had a vision of, we, to create a global brand, you need to create, create awareness and loyalty. So those were the key points. Um, and I suppose we took, took the kind of, the thing that we thought would work really well, which was social media. Um, and the fact that we thought we had a really great product and try to bring those two together to raise awareness. Absolutely, and I'm glad you touched on um, social media because you guys have a phenomenal following on it. And I think you know, it's partly because one, your food is incredible, but also it looks amazing. So how important do you think it is on social media to make food just look, you know, I want to say sexy almost, you know, when it's oozing and yeah. gooey, how important yeah. do you think it is? Yeah, I mean, you say that we, one of our biggest branding terms we use is food porn in, in the office because we're always talking about making products look really indulgent. And that works for our concept because if you look at desserts online, what attracts people to them is the most, you know, they want to see the most indulgent looking dessert, the most kind of over the top looking dessert. That's what sort of works on social media. So social media has been extremely important for our brand it's been what's helped us get awareness in not only in the uk but around the world and it's helped with our international expansion um it's been so key yeah so i we we owe a lot of our success to how things have gone on social media and have you changed or adapted the product since you first started to kind of get it a little bit more you know social media viral viral virality to kind of get it going at all 100 percent. so we obviously didn't really know anything about social media when we started and um if if anyone ever had enough time to scroll back and see some of our first pictures it, it was it's quite disturbing so and you could tell that we had no idea what we were doing but as kind of we spent more time on social media and we sort of started to see what 
what works? What do people want to see when it comes to desserts? And we knew that and we could see that food porn pictures were going viral. Um, and so there came a point and it's probably visible on our page if you scroll back that all of our content was food porn. And it was the, well, we would take content and make, you know, do photo shoots or video shoots. The focus was make it as indulgent as possible so that it has the opportunity to go viral. That was our mission for a very long time. And was that the kind of trigger point as well where you realized about the stacks that you guys do when you were like, right, instead of just selling the individual cookie doughs and take a picture of that, like, let's layer it and really get that dribble, that ooze going. Well, the stacks was the turning point for us. And I have to thank an influencer we worked with, Tom Siggy, but I don't know if you've heard of him. He actually helped us develop the first stack we ever did, the Slutty Brownie. Um, and when that went, online it just people just loved it and and we were like okay we, we now need to create a stacks range because this works this is what people want to see so we did that and then for, for a very long period of time as well we were just posting pictures of stacks i mean you probably wouldn't know that we did milkshakes and other cookie doughs through our instagram page but we were just posting what worked in order to build following and awareness and get people to to you know hear about us and can you provide a bit of context on kind of, say, what business was like, say, before, you know, the social media kind of really picked up to you guys versus, you know, you said that turning point when, was it Tom Eats, right? Tom Big, Tom's Big Eats, yeah. Tom Big Eats, okay. Um, when he came and sort of did his thing and it developed, it took a picture and then it all kind of started kicking off. Was there a really noticeable turning point in sort of how busy you guys were and revenue? Um, there was definitely a turning point through social media awareness and suddenly all these emails coming in of, you know, franchise requests because they'd seen our concept online. Um, so, th so that side of the business definitely was starting to get a lot of interest. And yeah, I mean, at the stores, you'd get people just coming up to the counter showing a picture of, of a picture they've seen on social media and saying, you know, I want this one. Uh, so <laughs> there was obviously something that was working. Um, people were seeing it online and because it had that kind of Instagram, you know, feel about it, people wanted to do the same thing, buy the product, take a photo and post it online. So yeah, there, there was definitely a moment where we were like, okay, this is, this is a little bit, this is impactful. Yeah. yeah. And has there been anything that you guys have done which, in terms of marketing that maybe you didn't expect to work or and just unexpectedly just you were like, wow, this is this has done well or just something you just didn't think would happen? Um, I mean, some of the things that worked for us really well was working with influencers. So that was a huge help for us. Um, and, and still is, we owe a lot to those guys because they did, help, them helping promote the brand um, was hugely, hugely beneficial. I think, Perhaps some of the kind of more, when we experimented with, with products and NPD, that really, that really helped gain more awareness on, on social media. So coming up with new flavors and new concepts. But yeah, I can't think of anything that really kind of surprised us too much. Yeah, not sure. Nothing, nothing there, yeah. And when you're thinking about like communication on your brand, is there any, is there like a key thing that you always stick to with the brand? It's a message that you want to get across. Is there something that you um, have at My Cookie Dough where you're like, this is what we want to stand for. This is what we want to get across. Totally. Um, so we've always been driven by, we can't, you know, we're not going to change the world by giving people desserts, but we can make someone's day or make someone smile when they get to try our products. So we want to be the best at doing desserts that's always been something we've tried to communicate through social media at our stores and through just innovation of our products. I think, yeah, and I think you guys, that's said that it's such a great brand because when you look at it, you just think playful, happy, not too serious. Like I'm just here to just enjoy myself. I'm not taking anything too seriously. And I think on yeah. everything you guys do, it just comes across so well. Oh, thank you. That's really nice to hear. Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, you're doing well. And I know that you hired a marketing strategist, um, Kyle. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> how, how important or how impactful has having someone work full time on sort of marketing and strategy? It's been essential for us. 
but we also got lucky because he's fantastic. I mean, especially because going back, you know, our mission being that we want to grow a brand and a strong brand and a brand that can hopefully become global. We knew we needed to invest in, in a, an amazing marketing team who would just be focused on that all the time. And it's a lot of, and also having someone who knows what they're doing because, you know, me and Ricky have no marketing experience. So it was, it was pretty essential to get someone who knew what they were actually doing. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, that was helpful. How, you know, how um, like important do you think it is for maybe someone to think about getting someone who, like you say, because it's so overwhelming, there's so much stuff involved in marketing. So how important do you think it is to get someone in quite soon for that marketing side of stuff? That's a good question. Obviously, there's a fine balance because you can't invest in those, that resource too early on. Every business knows it's too, it's too difficult to kind of hire full teams from day one. But so we had to do a lot ourselves. And, and I'm grateful for that because, you know, now I know more about marketing and branding than I did before. I, I had to learn. Um, but yeah, it, it comes to a stage where it depends on how fast you want to grow your, your brand or your company. And for us, we wanted to start growing and expanding. And that meant that me and Ricky couldn't, you know, do social media ourselves or, or try and come up with marketing concepts and plans and manage that area well. So that's when I think it was kind of, um, well, Kyle joined us two years ago. So he's, he's sort of not that early on um, in the journey. So yeah, after sort of three, four years, we got, we got him in. Great. And I want to go back to when you were talking about, you know, you saying yes to everything. And I know that you went to a festival. It was one of the first festivals. And can you tell us a little bit about that story? So it's, it's funny because I actually didn't want to do any festivals or any events. I'm, the team know I'm really against them because we were, we were opening so many stores. We sort of had a lot, of, a lot going on anyway. But this festival, um, it's, it's run by an amazing company. It's a food festival where pretty much all the best foods in London are in one place with music. So I was like, okay, let's give it a go. But I, we didn't think we were gonna be selling too many cookies. Um, we were kind of predicting a few hundred pounds a day or something. And then we got to the festival. Uh, we had like a little tent we'd, we'd picked up like a week before, so unprepared um, and like a little fridge with, with some cookies in there and, and just some ice cream tub. And then um, we were just kind of setting up and suddenly we just opened the tent at the front and then there's this, this queue, like it's like first thing in the morning. And we were like, okay, what's going on? And suddenly it just became like a, a queue that didn't end until 10 p.m. that night. And we, we just, within like the first two hours, we, we ran out of cookie dough. We had to go to a store, bring them in, get like, we had to actually, I actually had to that day go and pick up a fridge from like a local shop in the area and bring it to the site, you know, trying to carry it on like a little trolley through a park is, is quite ridiculous. So yeah, we had to do some mad, stupid things just to survive the next three days but it was such a success and we did we did really well so yeah, yeah I, just, I think that saying yes to stories, everything is crazy those stories are kind of the best thing that kind of summarize what it's like when you're starting out and to just get yeah. going it's just you're running around with a wheelbarrow full of cookie dough running to the front of the line <laughs> it was like that and it was funny because we didn't even bring many staff we just had our HQ team we thought you know it'd be like a fun day out for the team and everyone was just working around the clock um like we had a great time but we were all extremely exhausted by the end of it yeah yeah but you couldn't wait to get home you were like oh god yes yeah. <laughs> and that was the was big so festival wasn't it the big festival yeah amazing amazing festival yeah so good so um i mean i'm conscious of time so i was wondering if sure. we could just then finish off on our last few questions so one okay, question cool. i had for you was has there been any books or anything that you've read that has kind of helped your trajectory in business um i've been guilty of not reading enough to be honest especially when we first when we start the business you just don't know where time goes but <laughs> i do remember i do remember watching do you know the simon sinek ted talk about the why finding yes. the why i'm not sure if you know the one i think i watched that and and that kind of stuck with me and i still think of it throughout I have thought about it throughout the last few years because yeah you can go back and always say okay what are we trying to do here and we're trying to you know 
find our reason for what we're doing and find our vision and our goal and always go back to that and work through that. Um, so that's been a key thing, I think. And that goes back to your message, right, about bringing happiness to people we Exactly. And that's where you try to communicate yeah. in every single message, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we try to, yeah. Yeah, so, exactly, exactly. And, um, you know, if you could go back in time now and go talk to 2014 Andy, and, you know, you are where you are now, what advice would you go back and sort of give yourself? <laughs> Get, prepare yourself for, for the storm <laughs> ahead. It's going to be a ride. Um, I think I would, I would have probably um, invested more time in, in sort of learning about business leadership um, and growth because the transition from being a startup to suddenly having a team of people you need to look after and lead happens so quickly, you're not always going to be prepared for it. When you're so used to being in a bit of a startup hustler's mindset to go from that to suddenly I've got a team to look after now. I wasn't ready for that and I still, I'm still on a journey of learning, but I think that I would have tried to, to be more prepared in the past. Yeah, and do you have any tips at all for leadership that you've kind of learned, that you've realized are great leadership sort of skills to bring forward? Oh, I still have a lot to learn. Um, I think communication is a key thing, talking to everyone, spending time with every single one of your employees. We've always tried to create a culture where people are free to kind of create, um, to run it within their roles and, and do what they need to do. Um, so we never had like, you know, office clock-ins or whatever. People would just work wherever they wanted to and at, at any times they wanted to, um, which I think it, it worked, that, really, that worked for us. It, people felt free and flexible within their roles, which, um, which I think helped engage people more. So I think that was a useful thing to do. Amazing, yeah. I mean, definitely managing people is one of the, the, the challenges which no one tells you about being the most difficult thing, but uh, yeah. For sure, for, for sure, sure, yeah. And um, the final question, do you have like a main core bit of advice for anyone who's thinking about or wanting to start a food business? Is there something they should be focusing on or thinking about? Um, I think they should, from the get go define their purpose for what they're doing um, and also from the beginning probably look in to see how your business can grow and adapt and I think now more than ever we found that's so important um, you know if you're gonna if you're gonna do a cafe concept can you sell your products online as well um, so just I think adaptability and, and growth is, is a key thing to look at from day one so that you don't cap your business um, and not allow the opportunities to, to, to evolve and to change if it ever needed to. So yeah, I think that's, that's quite key. And I mean, you have that experience right now, right? I mean, you guys have had a massive pivot in kind of what you're doing as a business. So can you, I mean, cause you touched on it. Do you want to briefly talk about kind of the, the, the absolute change that you've had to make in your business? Sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we had to close our stores like many other retailers did. And um, we thought, well, if people can't come to us, we have to go to them. So let's, let's create something that is, is a bit fun. It's a bit lighthearted. People can make their cookies at home. And so we developed the DIY kit. And how, how's it gone? It's gone really well. I mean, um, the sales, sales were good and people have enjoyed kind of making our cookies at home and doing them in their way. So putting whatever toppings they want and having it in their own way, which so we've seen some very fun pictures of people's uh, creations, but it's been, it's been good to see that happen. And, and it's worked. It's helped us. It's been the reason why we're still around today after this, this tough period. Well, pe people want cookie dough and you guys give it to them. So, you know, well done. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. So, <laughs> thank I think you. that's a perfect point to, uh, to finish off. And I just want to thank you so much for coming on to the podcast, chatting. I mean, I've spoken to you about uh, our mutual friend, Temptation, who's on social media and you know him yeah. and I spoke to him about it and all he said was just how amazingly kind and wonderful you are. And I can see that now. That's so, so kind. Thank That's you so, so, much so, so for sweet. Coming on, I really appreciate it. So You're so welcome. Anytime, Jay. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Angie. Take care, thanks. Thank you so much again, guys, for listening to the podcast. 
say always, but always mean it. Really does mean the world to me. Um, again, if you want to find out more about how to start a food business, head to my website, www.jgreenwood.com. Love to hear from you what you guys think about the podcast as well. You can reach me at jgreenwood10 at gmail.com. And also, if you guys know any amazing people for me to interview, I'd love you guys to hit me up and give me an introduction. That would be amazing. But guys, thank you so much and be great.